In experiment 16, we're going to look at the titration curve of a weak monoprotic acid. So experiment 15, 16, and 17 follow a, a sort of a natural progression. Uh, in experiment 15, we look at a titration, um, and we look at a, basically we look at all the different components of a titration. So we look at how we set up a titration. We look at um, what is the analyte, what is the titrant. Um, we look at a process called standardization, which is how we can um, determine the exact concentration of our titrant and make sure that we know that for when we test an unknown. So in that setup, we had um, the titrant being a solution of NaOH that we wanted to standardize. And then we had a standard uh, solution of KHP where we knew the number of moles from the mass and then we determined the concentration of NaOH. And then in the second part of that experiment, we determined the concentration of an unknown uh, where the KHP that we used um, had some impurity in it, and then there was only some fraction of KHP that was actually there. So we used our standardized NaOH as the titrant in that, in that second titration. Now, the big difference between what we're going to be doing in experiment 15 and what we're going to be doing in experiment 16 is how we're going to visualize the endpoint. So in experiment 16, we visualized the endpoint using an indicator. So we relied on the indicator to change color, and that was a visual cue for when we had hit the endpoint. And we remember that the endpoint is an approximation of the equivalence point because even though it's very, very, very close because the, the indicator will change just a slightly past pH 7 and pH 8.2, um, there's still a slight difference there. And depending on how, you know, how little in terms of color you can get it, you're getting an approximation of the actual equivalence point, a very good approximation, but approximation nonetheless. Now, what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be using a different method for conducting the titration where we use a pH meter. And in this case, we're actually going to obtain the full titration curve where we measure the pH as a function of the volume of the titrant that's added. And then we're going to visualize that curve. So now let's, let's kind of start with some concept questions. So the first concept question we're going to address is what is the difference between a weak and a strong acid? And the other concept question that we're going to address is how do I know if an acid is weak or strong? Now, these are important because the titration curves for a, um, a weak acid versus a strong acid and a strong base uh, are different. And we're gonna look at that in a couple of slides. So we have, to know we have to know how do we know if an acid is weak or strong and what is the difference? So we're gonna take a look at that now. So strong acids, we kind of know this from back in the first semester. We had that table in Ebbing that gives us a list of strong acids. And what we basically told you was anything that's not on that list, um, that would be uh, perchloric acid, sulfuric acid, hydrochloric acid, hydroiodic acid, and so on and so forth. Anything that's not on that list of strong acids in the textbook is going to be a weak acid. And that's really all that we told you in the first semester. And then the other thing that we told you in the first semester when we were doing metathesis reactions was that what makes an acid strong is that it undergoes 100% ionization in water. So um, basically whatever you put in, in terms of the concentrate, in terms of the HCl, so if I have a one molar solution of HCl, I should get out a one molar solution of hyd uh, hydronium ion and a one molar solution of chloride ion. It's going to fully break up in water. So it's 100% yield of products. So that, that's what we said makes an acid strong. So the cutoff for that is that requirement. Now, of course, as we become more nuanced, and a key thing about this video is I'm gonna, we're gonna be making the assumption as instructors that you've learned this in class. I can't teach acid and base in a, you know, a 20 minute, 30 minute video um, all over again. So there's gonna be a lot of assumptions that you kind of remember things from class. So if you don't, I highly recommend that you look back at chapters 15 and 16 and review those concepts because we're going to be going through this video at a higher speed or a higher pace than we would if we were doing this in class when we were teaching it to you for the first time. So in semester two, we've developed a bit more of a nuanced um, picture of acids where we know that acid strength is related to the equilibrium constant and we call the constant for an acid Ka. And the we write this equilibrium constant like we would any other equilibrium constant. We take the product concentrations, divide it by the reacting concentration, HCl, and the products are the H3O plus and the Cl minus. And then we can kind of measure the ratio of products to reactants in an equilibrium mixture by looking at the magnitude of Ka. 
So in this case, uh, the Ka for HCl is a very large number, 10 to the 6th to 10 to the 11th. The reason why I put a range here is because it's it's somewhat difficult to actually measure these because they're so strong. They they go essentially 100% to product. So you have to really look for how much HCl is actually in there, and that concentration is essentially zero. Um, so it becomes a challenge to find any associated HCl in this solution since it really does dissociate. But you can see that these numbers are very, very large, which means that we have a, a tremendous um, preference for products in the reaction mixture at equilibrium. Um, and I put equilibrium in quotations because really we don't define this as an equilibrium. So in essence, in a one molar solution, the concentration of HCl is equal to zero and the concentration of H3O plus, it fully ionizes as one molar. Okay, so now let's look at how we can compare a weak acid to that. Well, so a weak acid, acid partially ionizes in water. So if it's strong, it 100% ionizes. If it's weak, it only partially ionizes. And this gives an equilibrium mixture of the weak acid and the hydronium ion in solution. So what we're seeing is a mixture of, of reactants and products. So we have some, in this case, this is acetic acid. Um, so we have some acetic acid that's in the solution, and we have some H3O plus, and we have some acetate. And they're all sort of mixed together with appreciable concentrations, measurable concentrations. Uh, the concentrations of these products may be very, very small in the case of a very weak acid, but they're there and they're measurable. And again, we have our Ka expression. So uh, the Ka in this case is equal to our products, which is the uh, acetate anion and the H3O plus and then our weak acid down on the bottom. And in this case, the um, Ka value for acetic acid is 1.8 times 10 to the minus five. So you can see the massive difference here. There's many, many, many orders of magnitude difference in these values. This is a relatively large number. This is a relatively small number. Um, so you can imagine that if this is ionizing 100%, this is not going to be ionizing 100%. Now, just to show you the structure of acetic acid so that we're all kind of on the same page, the acidic proton that we're working with is this H that's right here. And the difference between this has, there's many differences between these two, but a lot of what determines the Ka is the strength of the bond between the uh, acidic proton and whatever else it's bound to. And it turns out that the bond strength between HCl is rather weak, it's almost ionic, whereas this covalent bond between O and H is, is relatively strong in comparison. So that's what gives it a lower Ka. It's less likely to break off and ionize. So let's remember what a titration curve is. So if you remember from the last uh, pre-lab video, we did look at a titration curve and we actually looked at this exact titration curve that's here. Um, this one down here that's in black. And uh, a, a titration curve is the trend in pH of a solution. And remember, this, this setup can be any configuration you want. So um, in this particular experiment, we're going to be doing a weak acid with a strong base. Um, so the weak acid is going to be the analyte and the strong base is going to be the titrant. But you can have any configuration you want. Any weak or strong acid or base is the analyte and then the other one being either the base or the acid. Um, so if you use an acid, then you would titrate with a base because you want to have the acid-base reaction. So, um, but this can be in any configuration, but it turns out that we're going to be titrating a, um, a weak acid in this experiment. So let's look at how we can compare the titration curve for a strong acid and a weak acid. So just to show you how this is set up, um, unlike the last experiment where we had things in an Erlenmeyer flask, now we have things in a beaker. So this is gonna be our acid down here. Um, and it's either going to be 50 mils of one molar acetic acid, that's our weak acid, or we're going to compare this in a separate experiment to 50 mils of a one molar HCl solution. And this will be a strong acid example. And instead of using an indicator, we're going to put a pH electrode in here, which measures the pH of the solution as a function of the volume of NaOH that's added. So that's the graph that we're creating. So now if you look, what we're doing is, is we've got 50 mils of either one of these in the beaker and our titrant is going to be one molar NaOH. So we're using uh, 50 mils of one molar acetic acid or 50 mils of one molar HCl as our analyte. So now let's start to look at some similarities and differences. So let's kind of start this thing out at zero. So at here, at zero, this is where we have no base that's added. So in essence, what we have is we just have a beaker of 50 mils of acetic acid or a beaker of 50 mils of one molar HCl, we're putting our pH probe in and we're measuring the pH. So we haven't added any base. This is basically just looking at the pH of the acid. Uh, 
And if we kind of compare those numbers, uh, the starting pH for the one molar solution for the weak acid is going to be 2.4, and for the strong acid, it's going to be zero. So now this should kind of make sense in in two different ways, right? So in the in the first way, um, we have a strong acid and it has a lower pH than the weak acid, even though the concentration is exactly the same. So we're starting with the same concentration of acid. This solution is going to be more acidic. It's going to have a lower pH than this solution. So that makes sense sort of right off the bat. The other thing that's going to make sense is if you calculate the pH of a one molar solution, you take the negative log of one, you get zero. So we, if we have a one molar solution of HCl, we get the exact pH that we would expect. That means that all of the HCl broke apart and made H3O+. So whatever we put in in terms of HCl, we get out in terms of H3O+. Now for the weak acid, on the other hand, that's not the case. We put in a one molar solution and we don't get a pH of zero. We get something that's higher than a pH of zero, something that's more alkaline than that, than that strong acid. So essentially what this is telling us is that not all of that acid is breaking up. Only some of it's breaking up, giving us an, the H3O plus in solution. So that kind of situates us on this curve before we start adding any base. Now let's start to look at some things when we add base. So let's look at the volume of the equivalence point. Now we had covered this in the last video. We know that the equivalence point is when we have this rapid rise in the pH. And you can see that both of these solutions have the rapid rise right at exactly the same spot. So this is essentially perfect. They're both going to have their equivalence point in the same place. So the reason, just to kind of refresh your memory, the reason why we have this rapid rise is because, remember, as we're adding in base, this pH is going up this entire time. Now, before the equivalence point, we have our excess reagent is still the acid. We still have more acid than we have base. So the pH is going to be less than seven. That's true in both cases. So they're still, they're both acidic before the equivalence point. Now, um, when we start to approach the equivalence point at the excess reagent, the HCl is starting to get smaller and smaller and smaller. There's less and less HCl in that solution. So you can imagine that as you get very, very close, you're essentially not going to, you're going to have very little or almost no HCl, and now you're putting in a strong base. And when you're putting in that strong base and your HCl gets small enough, the pH is going to go from something acidic to something basic very, very quickly. And we remember from the strong acid case that when we reach the equivalence point, because the products are of the reaction of HCl and NaOH are water and um, sodium chloride, we get a pH of seven at the equivalence point. But let's just look at the equivalence point first. So in both cases, the volume is gonna be 50 milliliters. Now, to kind of refresh your memory, how do we calculate that? Well, we know that we have 50 mils of a one molar solution of acid. So if we convert the 50 mils to liters, and then we multiply it by the concentration, um, where we have 0 0.050 liters times 1.0 moles per liter, that gives us 0 0.0500 moles of acid. And we have to remember that at the equivalence point, moles of acid is equal to moles of base. So if we want to get the volume of the NaOH, and we know the concentration is one molar, 0 0.050 moles times one over the concentration, or we basically divide this by the concentration, gives us 0 0.0500 liters or 50 mils. And this doesn't matter. Uh, it doesn't make a difference whether the acid is weak or strong, because again, this, this reaction depends on the moles of the acid that's in there. It doesn't depend on how much the acid dissociates because the NaOH is directly reacting with the acid itself. So the volume at the equivalence point is going to be the same. Now let's look at the pH at the equivalence point because this is very interesting. So we already talked about what happens with the strong acid. That's because in this reaction we get a pH of 7. That's because in this reaction the product of this reaction is sodium chloride and water. And both of those things, sodium chloride is a neutral salt. So the product of that reaction is going to be a neutral solution with a pH of 7. Now the interesting thing with a weak acid is the products are going to be a little different. We're going to make, um, from acetic acid, we're going to make water and sodium acetate, which is the conjugate base of acetic acid. Remember, when you deprotonate a weak acid, you make its conjugate base. So when we get to the equivalence point with a weak acid, we now have a base that's in solution. So the pH is going to be above seven because the acid there is not a neutral salt. It is an, a salt that will, um, it, it's a salt that will 
ionize in water and form um, a small amount of, of acetic acid again, making it slightly basic. So it's going to kind of go in the reverse direction. You can think of that. So that's why we see this slightly higher than 7 pH um, in the weak acid. And then if you look, what's really kind of interesting is once you get past the equivalence point, these two graphs overlay each other. There's no distinguishable difference between the weak acid and the strong acid. Now, experimentally, that is not always perfectly um, the case, uh, meaning, you know, you may not you may not get this experimentally perfect like this, but you will get something extremely close to this. Uh, and the answer, the reason for that is because once we've neutralized the uh, the acid and once we've neutralized the weak acid, we're now adding in a strong base. And that strong base is going to dominate the solution. NaOH is the strongest base that's in that solution at that point. So for, for the HCl case, NaCl is not even basic. So the only thing we're adding at that point is strong base. In the case of the weak acid where we have the sodium acetate, we have a strong base and a weak base. And the strong base is going to dominate that, that solution. So that's why we see, because in essence, what we're doing is, is we're adding sodium hydroxide to water at this point. So um, that's what tends to dominate the, the, P, the curve after the uh, NaOH, after we get past the equivalence point. Okay, so now again, I want to stress that these calculations that I'm doing for this titration curve, you already did in class. So this is a review of things that you've already learned in class. Now, if you came from Fordham University, uh, these calculations should look very familiar because we use the Ebbing textbook and that does this calculations this way. There are, for all of these calculations that we're going to do for the titration curve, there are some different ways to do them. Um, for example, with the Henderson-Hasselbach, there is another way of doing it where you make an ice table. We don't have a preference for how you do the calculations as long as you can get the correct answers which are, you know, what is the concentration of the H3O plus, or what is the pH? What is the concentration of the acetate? So you have to be able to do these calculations um, and get the correct answer. But we're okay if you use, um, for example, when we're doing buffer calculations, Henderson-Hasselbach or the ice table. It doesn't, doesn't matter as long as you get the right answer. And again, we're going to be going through this a little faster than we would normally go through it in, in lecture because you've already saw this. So if you need to review, Go back and look at chapters 15 and 16 in Ebbing. So now we're going to focus in on that titration curve of a weak acid, and we're going to start to dissect it and look at the different parts. So remember, when we, when we started this, the first part of that curve is when we have no base. So what we have is a solution of 50 mils of one molar acetic acid, and we know how to handle this. If you're given a um, if you're given a solution with a concentration of a weak acid, you immediately know it's an ice table problem, right? Because that acid's going to be sitting in the in the water. It's going to deprotonate partially to give us some H3O plus and some acetate. So we have to immediately go to the Ka expression, and we have to know our Ka. So in this case, the Ka for acetic acid is 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5. That's something that you would look up. Um, if you were doing these calculations, or we would give it to you in the problem, for example, and um, you would set up the ice table. So now um, going through this kind of quickly, uh, we know that our starting concentration is one molar. And remember, it doesn't matter what the volume is in an ice table calculation because for ice tables, the volume is not going to change over the course of the reaction, right? At all points in the reaction, the volume remains the same. So in an ice table, we have our concentrations of the various species on top, and then we have ICE, initial change equilibrium. We plug in our initial conditions where we have one molar of the HA, and we want to figure out how much is this breaking up into. So when we start, we only have the HA, and we have no A- minus or H3O+. Plus. Then we decide what the change is going to be. And we get these, these values here um, by pulling directly from the stoichiometry. So for every one acetic acid, that's going to go away because it's a reactant. So we put minus 1x. So however much of this is going to go away, we pull the stoichiometric coefficient. So that's going to be a 1. And then for A minus, which is the C2H3O2 minus, again, HA represents weak acid. So this is the H and this is this component here. The acetate is the A. And then so the A minus is going to be the acetate anion. So we pull the stoichiometric coefficient here. This is going to be plus 1x from the stoichiometry, and the H3O plus is going to be plus 1x 
And then at equilibrium, that means that we're going to have one molar minus x, x, and x. So we can plug these values into the Ka expression, and we get x squared over 1.0 molar minus uh, over 1.0 molar. Now I know we have here 1.0 molar minus x. You have to go back and remember that we can do the approximation. If this value divided by this value is greater than 100, that means that the that the x value is very very small in comparison to your concentration. So you can actually get rid of the x. So if you don't remember how to do the approximation. Take a look at how to do that in ebbing. So when we solve this expression, basically we take the bottom, we, we multiply 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5 times 1, then we take the square root. We get a concentration of the H3O plus. So again, the A minus and the H3O plus are both going to equal X, but we're interested in the pH here. So we get 0 0.00424 molar, and then if we take the log, we take the negative log of that, we get a pH of 2.37. So from first principles, we we're able to calculate this initial point. So even though this is experimental data, this is a, an experimental titration curve, um, we can actually calculate this first point from first principles without having to do any, um, without having to make any assumptions. We can do this right from the ice table. Okay, so now let's look at what happens when we start to add some base. So any point after zero and before the equivalence point is going to be in what we call the buffer region. What happens is, is when, when we add some OH minus to this, the OH minus is going to react with our weak acid to make water. Um, that's going to pull the proton off and some acetate. So uh, adding any OH generates a mixture of the weak acid and its conjugate base. And you know when you hear weak acid and conjugate base, Henderson-Hasselbach, uh, which is the equation for Henderson-Hasselbach is pH is equal to pKa plus the log of A minus over HA. So now let's just pick a representative example. So now we, we're going to oh, we're going to have our burette here. It's got one molar NaOH in it. Let's say that we add two mils of NaOH. So we're going to pop in and we're going to take our first data point right here. Obviously, the pH is going to go up because we're adding base. Whenever you add base to anything, the pH goes up. But the question is, how much does it go up? Well, we have to figure out what our limiting reagent is. So we're going to set up a limiting reagent table. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our number of moles of acid which we calculate from the volume and the concentration. So if you take 0 0.050 liters times one molar, you get 0 0.050 moles. And if we take two mils or 0 0.002 liters times one molar, we get 0 0.002 moles. And remember, uh, in the, at the beginning of this, we have no acetate because the reaction hasn't taken place yet. So now if you look at these two numbers, we got to figure out which one's our limiting reagent. And obviously in this case, the limiting reagent is going to be the OH minus. So we're going to subtract the OH minus because we know that our limiting reagent is going to be taken away from the excess reagent. And then we're going to have zero moles of our limiting reagent at the end of this. So when we do our subtractions, we're going to have 0 0.048 moles of the um, acetic acid left over. And then on the other side, if we subtract 0 0.002 moles here, we're going to add 0 0.002 moles over here. Um, and that's going to give us our, um, our, our number of moles of the acetate product. So, uh, and we do this all by stoichiometry. So this is just a stoichiometry problem where we're figuring out, we're basically doing a limiting reagent problem. So we're in one step, we're figuring out what is our excess reagent and what is our um, amount of product. So now we can go and immediately start to plug things into uh, Henderson-Hasselbach. So if you take the negative log of the Ka, which is 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5, you get 4.74 for the pKa. And then we can plug in our uh, moles of A minus over our moles of HA. And just remember, the reason why we can use moles is because both of these are going to be in the same volume. So this is going to be 52 mils after we add the 2 mils of the NaOH. So if we were to divide both of these by 52, the 52 is going to cancel anyway. So we can just use the log of the moles divided by the log of the moles. That's something that you can do with Henderson-Hasselbach. So if you solve that, pH is going to equal 3.36. So again, at 2 mils, we're able to calculate the exact pH using Henderson-Hasselbach. So we're doing pretty good. Anywhere in this buffer region, we can use Henderson-Hasselbach. The only time it starts to break down is when you get very, very close to the equivalence point. So the Henderson-Hasselbach is not going to be very good at calculating this rise, but anything throughout this buffer region, you should be good to use the Henderson-Hasselbach. 
and for Gen Chem, we won't be asking anything where, you know, in the buffer region, we won't be asking you anything where it'll be close to the, the rapid. So let's look at the, the, the pH at the equivalence point. So this is a little bit of a more challenging problem because now we have to contend with um, the conjugate base that's made. So let's look at how we work this problem through. So the pH at the equivalence point, uh, we know that at this point the weak acid is fully converted to the conjugate base. So now, because we don't have a mix of weak acid and uh, weak bit and the, the conjugate base, we just have conjugate base, we have to revert back to an ice table problem. So let's kind of dissect this problem from the, the steps. We know that the equivalence point is at 50 mils of NaOH. We calculated that back on that original slide where we looked at the two different titration curves. So we know that. Now it shouldn't surprise you that that's the case because when you start to do the math, uh, 0.050 liters times one molar gives you 0 0.050 moles. And you get the exact same calculation when you do the NaOH. So uh, these two values, when this reaches 50 mil, become the same, and that's the definition of the equivalence point. So when we do our subtractions and our addition, because these are gonna go away, we get zero moles of the OH minus, zero moles of the acetic acid, and we get 100% products, which is the sodium acetate. So this is why it's basic, because now we just have base and solution. So when you have this sodium, when you have this acetate in solution and there's some water around, it's going to go in the reverse direction of our original reaction, and it's going to take a proton from the water and make some OH minus. So this is the definition of a base, and we can write the KB equation for this, where we have OH minus times the HC2H3O2, which is the product, divided by the acetate anion, which is the reactant. Now, the question is, is how do we get the KB for this? We have to remember um, that the KA and the KB are related to KW, which is 1 times 10 to the minus 14. So the way that I can calculate this very quickly is by taking 1 times 10 to the minus 14 divided by the 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5, which is the KA for water, and then you get 5.6 times 10 to the minus 10. So I didn't have to look this up. I was able to calculate it knowing that KW is equal to KA times KB. So now here's a challenging part to this uh, equation. Here's a challenging part of this um, component of the calculation. So we have the setup, but in this case, to set up our ice table, we need to have the concentration of A minus. So we know the number of moles from our limiting reagent table. We calculated that this is going to be 0 0.050 moles, but we have to get the volume in this case because we need to know an actual concentration to set up the ice table. Unlike Henderson Hasselbach, we have to actually concentrate the we have to actually calculate the concentration. So remember, we started with 50 mils of acetic acid, but now we've also added 50 mils of the sodium hydroxide to it. So we start with 50 mils, we add 50 mils of sodium hydroxide, giving us a grand total of 100 mils. So if we do the calculation here, if we divide 0 0.050 divided by 50 mils plus 50 mils, which is 0.1 liters we get 0 0.50 molar. And remember, I just can, I, just to, for the sake of display, I put this in milliliters, but remember when we calculate a concentration, we have to convert this to liters. So just keep that in mind. That's how I get 0 0.50 molar. So then we set up our ice table where our initial concentration of the A minus is 0 0.5 molar. Uh, then we have zero molar and zero molar. Uh, we subtract the X, so 0 0.5 molar minus X um, zero molar plus X and plus X. We get that from the stoichiometric coefficients. Uh, there's a one for this, a one for this, and a one for this. And remember, products always get positives and reactants always get negatives. So then at equilibrium, we're gonna have 0 0.5 molar minus X, X, and X. So again, we can set this up where our we use our approximation. We get rid of the X on the bottom. Uh, we can set up our KB expression Solve for, the con solve for the X, which is equal to the concentration of OH minus. That's equal to 1.6 times 10 to the minus five molar. We can get the POH, which is the negative log of that. That's 4.78. And then we can calculate pH, which is equal to 14, which is K PKW minus 4.78. So that's 9.22. And so then we get our, uh, then we get our pH at the equivalence point. And we can see that this is basic because we've made
uh, sodium acetate as our product, as our only product in that solution. So now let's look at the last calculation, which is an interesting one, because we said after we get past that equivalence point, the sodium hydroxide is what becomes the excess reagent. That's a strong base, so it's going to be, the whole thing is going to be de dependent on how much excess base we have in there. So let's look at the case of 60 mils of NaOH. So in this case, we see that our limiting reagent now becomes the acetic acid, which makes sense because if we, when we get past the equivalence point, we're going to have our excess reagent being base, which means that our pH has got to be above 7. So when we do our subtraction, we subtract away our limiting reagent, we're going to get 0 0.010 moles of the OH minus and 0 0.050 moles of the C2H3O2 minus. Now, you can put this into an ice table as what we call a common ion problem. And what you're going to get from the assumption is that the OH minus is going to be what dominates. So again, I know I'm going through this a little fast, but if you have to review common ion effect in acids and bases, go back and look at the lecture problem from, um, from, your, from chapter 16. So we can, we can just summarize this by saying, because this is the strongest base in solution, this is what's going to dominate the pH. So we can directly calculate the concentration of OH- minus by taking the 0 0.010 moles of excess OH-, minus, and then dividing that by the 50 plus 60 mils. So the 50 mils is the starting volume of the acetic acid. We've added 60 mils of NaOH. And remember, I divide this by a thousand to get liters because the concentrations is in moles per liter. So I'm just showing this for clarity so you can see where I'm pulling these, these volumes from. So we get 0 0.091 molar. And then we can get the pOH by taking the negative log of that and then the pH, which is equal to 14 minus the, the pOH. So again, we can calculate the 12.96 directly by using our reagent table and knowing that OH minus dominates at the beyond the equivalence point. So a word of warning, um, and this is really important, um, because acids and bases are so integral to the second semester of general chemistry, be prepared to do any of these calculations on the quiz and final. Um, this is really important. Generally speaking, it's going to, there. So, to, so that we can kind of hone the scope in a little bit, all of the calculations will be related to the titration of a weak acid with a strong base. So it's not like we're going to pull like some random thing. They'll all be weak acid, strong base calculations, but you should be able to calculate any point along a titration curve for the quiz or final. Um, just be prepared for that. So if you have to go back and review um, how to do A, buffer, C, or D, now is the time to do that. You've been warned for the quiz. Okay, so now let's look at today's experiment, which is the titration of an unknown weak acid. So what are our goals for today? Our goals are to determine the concentration of the acid, right? We don't know what the concentration is, so we want to figure out what is the concentration. That's classic. Uh, that's the classic objective of a titration. Then the second thing we want to do is we want to determine, hey, what's the pKa of this acid? Because if we know what the pKa is, we can look up in the table the pKa and then make a guess as to, as to what acid we have. So we don't know what the acid's going to be here. So let's look at how we set this up experimentally. So the first thing we're going to do is we got to measure out 25 mils of our unknown acid. We have to have some volume of acid that we're going to start with. So we use what's called a volumetric pipette. A volumetric pipette looks like this. This is a volumetric pipette. And what you do is you basically fill it up with your liquid until the, um, the liquid level is at this mark. And this is where the bottom of the meniscus is going to be. And we use these little bulbs to um, basically create a vacuum that sucks the solution up. You get the solution all the way sucked up to this mark, and then you've got exactly 25.00 mils uh, of acid. And then we're going to transfer that to a clean, dry beaker. So we're going to put our acid into this beaker um, with, uh, with uh, we're going to put our acid into this clean, dry beaker. Then we're going to set up our burette with the standardized NaOH solution that you prepared in experiment 15. So you're going to take the, the average concentration from part one of experiment 15, and that's what you're going to use for the NaOH, right? That's why we standardize the NaOH. We're going to continue to use that as we go through for um, experiment 17 as well. 
Okay, so uh, then what we're going to do is we're going to calibrate the pH meter and place the probe into the solution of the unknown acid. So this is just a couple of steps, and to do this, what we do is we take the meter and we put it into a solution where the pH is 7, and we tell the meter this is 7. Then we take that, that um, probe out, we clean it off, and we put it into a solution that's pH 4, and we tell the meter this is pH 4. And from those two data points, it um, it sort of calibrates itself into the right pH range. And then it knows you know, that this voltage is equivalent to this pH. OK, so now let's look at how we're going to do this. So now what we're going to do is we have our setup. We have our burette. We have our, um, we have our beaker. We have our pH electrode in here. And what we're going to do is we're going to start to add some sodium hydroxide. So we're going to start to add sodium hydroxide and measure the pH as a function of the volume added. So we're going to start by adding 2 mL increments until you approach the equivalence point. So you'll see we're starting to build our titration curve. So every 2 mL, you're going to um, take the pH. And then we're going to create this graph. And this computer actually does this for you. So we have the pH electrode hooked up to the computer. And then you go in on your burette, you measure two mils, and you type in the exact volume you put in. You read off the burette to the two significant figures. So you type in the volume, and then it puts a data point. So you could see those data points emerging. Now, as we approach the equivalence point, we got to slow down a little bit because this is going to kind of rise very quickly. So the next thing we're going to do, if you watch the curve, is we're going to start to take one mil increments. And you can see that we start to do one mil increments, and now we're going to go, we're kind of going up really fast. So we're going to slow down even more when we get toward the equivalence point because we want to get a lot of data points in here um, as we go through the equivalence point. So now we're going to slow down to 0.1 mil, and it's going to go slow, and then it's going to rise very, very quickly. So as we added 0.1 mils. Okay, so then we get our data points going up here. And then once we get past the equivalence point, we can kind of go fast again and just get the end part of the curve. So we can switch back to two mil increments. So this is exactly what you would see. This is actually a this is a recording of what data student data would be as they as they took it. It's much faster, but that's a literal recording of, of student data from, from an experiment. Okay, so let's look at our first objective here, which is um, how do we determine the concentration of the equivalence point? Uh, how do we determine the concentration of the acid from the equivalence point? So we have our graph. This is the, the data that the student collected. Um, and we want to figure out where is the equivalence point. Now, we can't really go in here and just say, well, you know, the equivalence point looks like it's about here. That's about the middle of that rise. So, yeah, I'm going to take that. That doesn't work. That's not that be too much of an approximation. So the question becomes, how do we actually get an accurate measurement from this graph where we're not just going in and kind of saying, well, it looks like this. And what we're going to do is we're going to do some calculus. Now, luckily, you guys don't have to do any calculus yourself. So the software that we use to collect this data is called Vernier. And the Vernier software has a feature inside of it where it can calculate the first and second derivatives. So what is a derivative? A derivative is a measurement of the instantaneous rate of change, right? So we talked about this when we talked about um, reaction rates. So we have average versus instantaneous rates of change. Well, you can see that here we kind of have a high rate of change. It goes faster, and then it kind of slows down in the buffer region, and then all of a sudden it starts to pick up again. And we see that, right? So we kind of start with a high rate of change, and then it kind of goes to a very low rate of change. And then all of a sudden, as we approach the equivalence point, you can see this is about 35 right here, and this is about 35 right here. We get this big spike. And that makes sense, because what's happening is, is all the rate starts going up, it goes 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 up. And then all of a sudden, as we go past the equivalence point, it starts slowing down, slowing down, slowing down, slowing down, slowing down. So we see this nice sharp peak right where the equivalence point is. So the, the peak of the first derivative or the maximum rate of change in the rise region is where the equivalence point is. And again, we could just go in and find this the, where this peak is and, and measure it. But there's an even better way of looking at this. So if you go and you take the second derivative, which is where we take the derivative of the derivative. So now we're going to look at the rate of change of this. Well, this is going to have a very rapid rise in the rate of change. And then at the peak, 
it's going to kind of go flat and have no change and then and then past the peak it's going to start to go down and that's what we see here we see this rising rate of change and then it goes through zero right where the top of the peak would be and then on the other side it kind of re recovers so we get this 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 point where the second derivative crosses the zero that is that at that precise location where the second derivative crosses the zero that's going to be the peak here where the um where the derivative goes to where the derivative of the derivative goes to zero or where this thing becomes flat that's the equivalence point so you're going in and you're finding out where is this equivalence point and i'm going to show you how to approximate that using excel um, we have an even better method for doing it on vernier but since we don't have um, vernier we're going to do it in excel so we're going to use the second derivative to figure out the equivalence point and if you can see here, where this crosses the zero is at 37.5 milliliters. Um, the way that we would do this is we we're going to take the two data points that are on either side, and then we're going to take the average of those data points. And that's going to give us a very accurate measurement of the point where it crosses zero. Okay, so we decided from our second derivative graph that the equivalence point is at 37.5 mils of 0.1 molar NaOH. So now if we want to know what the concentration of the acetic acid was originally, we have to do some stoichiometry. So we're going to convert this to liters, 0 0.03750 liters. We know that our concentration is 0.1 moles for every one liter. This was the standardized solution that this particular student used. So in this case, in experiment 15, they figured out that their solution was exactly 0.100 moles per liter. In your case, it's not going to be that. It's going to be some other number that you determined in experiment 15. So you're going to use your number, not this number. Um, and then for, once we have moles of NaOH, we can go back to the balanced reaction. And we know that for every one mole of NaOH, we have one mole of acetic acid. So uh, following the stoichiometry and unit conversions through, we get 0 0.003750 moles of acetic acid. Now our goal is to get the concentration of the acetic acid. So remember, to get a concentration, we need moles and liters. So we put in our moles from our stoichiometry, and we have to divide by the volume of the acid. So what we're interested in is, what was the concentration when this whole thing started? So in that original 25 milliliters, that's our unknown, what was the concentration? So we now have our number of moles, we have our volume, and we can calculate the concentration being 0 0.1500 molar. Now yours, again, won't be this exact. It's going to be have some other number than this, but this is just an example from, from student data that I had. Okay, so that shows you how to calculate the concentration from the equivalence point. Now, the other thing that we have to do is we have to determine the pKa of the unknown acid from the half equivalence point. So now, hopefully, you guys remember back to buffers, that the half equivalence point is really important in a buffer. And the reason for this is because if we look at Henderson-Hasselbach, something magical happens at the half equivalence point. Let's say that we start with a one molar HA. So what is the half equivalence point? Well, at the equivalence point, the uh, number of moles of the acid would equal the number of moles of the base. So we would have one, let's say it was uh, in one liter and we had one molar, so it'd be one mole of acid, we would have one mole of base. Well, at the half equivalence point, we have one mole of acid and a half a mole of base. So when we do our table, that's going to give us, uh, that half a mole is going to react away, and we're going to get half taken away from our acid, and we're going to get half of our A minus being generated. So at the equivalence point, at the one half equivalence point, A minus is going to equal HA. So the ratio of A minus is going to equal HA. It's going to be half of whatever the starting number of moles are. So uh, we're, if we were at one mole at the beginning, this is going to be a half of a mole, and this is going to be a half of a mole. So when we divide a half by a half, we get 1. And when you take the log of 1, that's 0. So pH is equal to pKa at the half equivalence point. So if our equivalence point was 37.50 milliliters, we can figure out what the volume of our half equivalence point is by dividing this by 2. That's 18.75 mils. And then we can go in and read that pH off of the off, whatever the pH is at that volume. And that's going to be our pKa. So it looks like this one is around 4.7 um, or 4.8 um, from this graph. We just read that right off um, from where our half equivalence point is. So the way that we're getting this value is we're not, we're not measuring this in any way. We're measuring the equivalence point, and then we're taking exactly half that volume 
we're finding that xy coordinate and then figuring out what the pH is at that xy coordinate. Okay, so let's look at our sample data. Um, so what you're going to, on, on Blackboard, you're going to get the following data. This is going to be our titration curve data. And this is actual student data from the lab. And you can see that, you know, when you do this yourself, um, since, you know, this is a lot of students' first time doing this, they're not going to get something as pretty as what I showed in the data. But the data is still very good. Um, that You can still see the buffer region, the rise, and you're going to get a very good equivalence point from this. So what the vernier would spit out is this first graph, the titration curve, which we, we see has the right shape. And then the vernier is automatically going to calculate your second derivative for you. So um, you wouldn't have to do that by hand or anything like that. That just comes out of the software and is done for you. Now the question is, is well, how do we work with this data in Excel? And really you have a couple of options for what you can do. Um, one of the, the easiest things to do is, well, we want to find where this thing crosses zero, right? So we want to find where in the second derivative data this thing goes through zero. Well, if we look at this, this is somewhere between 10 and 15. So it's going to be around 12.5. So let's kind of come over here and look at that. And right here we can see, well, this has got to be where it's going through the zero, right? We're going from some large positive number down to some large negative number. So um, this is going to be where we have our our transition from that large positive number to that large negative number. This is where we actually literally cross through the zero between these two data points. So now you have two options. A simple option for those people who are not very comfortable using Excel is to simply take the average of these two data points. So, you know, you can take 12.49 and 12.64 and you can say, well, okay, we have one point that's on the left and we have one point that's on the right, one point that's up here, one point that's down here. We have the, the second derivative values. We know that this is where it's going through zero. We have the volume values. So if we take a middle between those two, that's going to be a pretty good representation of where that crosses zero. So if you take the average of 12.49 and 12.64, uh, and figure out what that is, that's going to give you your equivalence point. So you could do it that way. Another way of doing it is, um, for those people that know a little bit more about Excel, is you can actually do a linear interpolation through this. So if you're good at Excel, what you can do is you can actually fit these data points to a line um, that's going through the zero. So you can kind of start at the peak here, go down to the bottom of the peak here, take those data points and separate them out, put a straight line through it using the trend line feature. And then using that trend line, you can calculate what the X intercept is. When, when what is the Y, what is the, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, what is the X intercept? So when Y goes to zero, when Y equals zero, what is the value of X? And then that will give you an even better representation of the data point. So try it both ways. If you know how to use Excel and you feel comfortable doing that, or you want to ask your instructor, this is the time to learn how to do this guys. So if you don't know how to do that, you should give it a try. But as a kind of a quick cop out, what you can do is you can just take the average of those two. Okay, so once you have that volume, that's going to be your volume at the equivalence point. And then we're going to do the same process. So um, we're going to figure out to get the pKa, we're going to figure out, well, what's half of that volume? So in this case, it's going to be about six or something like that, six and a half, uh, 6.75, whatever. You divide the equivalence point volume by two, whatever you get. Now, again, that's not going to be one of these precise numbers. It's going to be in between one of these numbers. So, again, we're going to have to go in and we're going to have to find, like, let's say, for example, the value was, it's not going to be this, but I'm just giving an example. Let's say the example is 4.4. .4, okay. You calculate the, the half equivalence point should be at 4.4. .4. It's not going to be that. I'm just using it as an example. But anyway. So again, the two data points that straddle 4.4, 4.12 is on the low side and 4.63 is on the high side, we could go in here and we could take an average and that would be pretty good. But if you're good at Excel, what you can do is, again, you can take a few points, use a linear fit, and then calculate um, at what uh, what Y value would correspond to that X value from the trend line fit. So, um, so that, that's what you can do. But so that's how you're going to analyze the data. That's how you're going to get your um, volume from the second derivative and then your, P, your pH from the, the titration data, which is going to be equal to pKa. Okay, so let's just take a quick look at the, the 
uh, data analysis from the determination of the pKa of the unknown acid. So in this particular case, um, we have to. F there are two parts of this. So uh, and it turns out that they're a little bit backwards. So the first part on at the top of the the data sheet is the determination of the pKa. So I would actually, if I were you, I would start with the concentration part first. Um, because we got to figure out what the equivalence point is to do everything in this and then work backwards from the concentration up to the uh, the equivalence point like I showed you working through the data analysis. So in the data sheet we have pre-filled in that it's 25.00 milliliters because we use that volumetric flask to get that. So the molarity of NaOH is going to come from experiment 15. That's your molarity of the standardized NaOH solution. The volume at the equivalence point is going to be from the second derivative data. And then from the molarity, you have to use that second derivative data and the concentration to get the molarity of the acid. So once you know the number of milliliters at the equivalence point, you can then put uh, that up here. You could put the volume at the half equivalence point, and then you're gonna read off the pKa from the graph and then calculate the Ka um, from the pKa, okay? So that's how you're gonna fill out the data sheet. Make sure you show all your calculations to get full credit. Uh, this lab is our first lab where we're doing a lot of, you know, calculations related to S's and bases. So if you have any questions about that, feel free to ask your instructors. And remember that this experiment is due on the date that the syllabus says it's due.